Good afternoon, HOSA leaders. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> national HOSA and your National Executive Council welcome you, the Washington Leadership Academy, Class of 2015. For the past nine years, WLA has bolstered our HOSA leaders across the nation and helped unify us as a national organization. This year, we are honored and excited to have over 178 members in attendance, making this WLA our largest one yet. Over the next few days, you'll be given insight and the soft skills necessary to take your role as a leader and future health professional to the next level. Almost 200 years ago, our founding fathers built our democracy, and the principles they embodied continue to impact the present and future of we, the people. While here, you will have the opportunity to visit monuments that represent the leaders that made this nation great. Those who came before us lived by principles that set high standards for current and future leaders, leaders like us. They demonstrated their care for their country by developing communities of equals for we the people by holding themselves accountable to protect and defend we the people, by building relationships through compromise and consensus based on the will of we the people, and holding themselves responsible for personal excellence and excellence in their efforts for we the people. They lived their beliefs. They cared. And so, the national officers have decided that this year's WLA theme will be, We Care. HOSA has much to be proud of in its history and has created a powerful legacy. And now it's up to us to write its next chapters. This year's NLC in Anaheim, California was our largest one yet with over 8,500 members in attendance. And we were especially excited to have our international affiliates from Mexico and Canada HOSA. As the HOSA fever rages, there could not be a more exciting time to be a HOSA leader. And we believe that with your help, the 2015-2016 HOSA year can be the greatest in our historical legacy. The National Leadership Conference in Nashville, Tennessee should prove that the best is yet to come. Thank you for participating and, well, thank you isn't really the word. Congratulations on taking advantage of this opportunity and we couldn't be more excited to work alongside you over these next few days. At this time, we would like to thank the following leaders in attendance. Dr. Jim Kinniger, our National Executive Director, Ms. Karen Kinniger, our Deputy Executive Director. <laughs> National staff members, Mr. Jeff Kinniger and Bobby Crandall. <laughs> and Mr. Mark Burley, who will be facilitating the HOSA Leader Section. <laughs> and Mr. Paul Bowden, who will be facilitating the State Officer Section alongside the National Executive Council. <laughs> At this time, it is my honor to introduce your National President-Elect, Elizabeth Carnesi.
Good afternoon. Again, my name is Elizabeth Carnesi, and I am honored to be serving as your 2015-2016 National President-Elect. We are all gathered here because we share a common interest in the health careers, of course. We are the future of the health professions and the health careers. I'd now like to invite Tammy Phillips up. My name is Tammy Phillips, and I am your National Secondary Board Representative. We are all gathered here for one common goal, and it is our passion for HOSA. In other words, we are all future health professionals. Now please help me welcome Santina Cherian. Hello, state officers and distinguished guests. My name is Santina Cherian, and it is my honor to serve as your Region 1 Vice President. We are all here today because we share, a common we share common values, and that is that we care. And now, Julius Wade. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julius Wade, and I'm very excited to serve you as your Region 2 Vice President. We're all here because of a common conviction in HOSA's mission a mission that's dedicated to providing thousands of opportunities to thousands of future health professionals around the world. And now, Akshar Patel. Hello, everyone. My name is Akshar Patel, and I am very honored to be your Region 3 Vice President. We are gathered in Washington, D.C. because we have common career interests, which will allow us to grow and become the future health leaders of tomorrow. Now, I'd like to invite Aditya Vinjamuri. Hello, everyone. It is my privilege to serve as your 2015-2016 National Post-Secondary Collegiate Vice President. Uh, we are all gathered here in this fine city of Washington, D.C. for the WLA Washington Leadership Ac Academy experience. Tavares Rowe. Good evening, HOSA leaders. My name is Tavares Rowe, and it is my pleasure to serve as your 2015-2016 post-secondary collegiate board representative. And I might say that I am very proud that you are all taking the first step into becoming the next future health professionals and building a better health community. Thank you. Your 2015-2016 National Executive Council. It is our hope throughout this WLA that while you all arrived here as individuals, you'll leave as We Care teams, equipped to bettering your communities as future health professionals. Santina? There are just a few reminders that I'm going to go over so that we can make the best time and best use of our time here together. We will be having one break per session. The restrooms are located right out these doors and to your, to your left. For your meals, please make sure that you have your name badges on you and please wear your name badges at all times so that we know who you are. Um, for respecting, our, for respecting yourself and for those around you, please keep your cell phones on silent and away. Your National Executive Council will be doing the same, and we ask that you do the same so that we can be engaged and present throughout the entire weekend. Um, I'm going to go over a phrase that you may or may not have heard before of, and it's, it, it goes, return on investment. And basically all that means is that HOSA has invested in you. Your state chapter has invested in you. Your local chapter has invested in you. Many people have invested in you. And whenever you're invested in, there's a return that is expected. And so whenever we leave this conference, let's be, let's take an arsenal of things that we can take back with um, being more effective leaders and um, being different and making sure that it counts. The final thing that I want to go over is that we need to make sure that we respect the hotel and the personnel. Uh, whether that be by tipping our servers, making sure that we remember that, being patient with the front desk, uh, making sure that we let others go in front of us, not taking anything as a memory, um, and just practicing integrity uh, wherever we are. 
Uh, we and that's just because we, we represent the Hosa brand. And whenever people see us, whenever people see each and every single one of us, they see Hosa. Um, so let's be as professional and on our uh, on our best behavior uh, as much as possible. And with that, I'd like to invite Amit back on stage. It is my honor to introduce a very special guest with us here today. She has a doctor of physical therapy, an orthopedic clinical specialist, and holds a PhD. She is the lead on the system for health and performance triad that focuses on sleep, physical activity, and nutrition as the cornerstones of healthy living. She has served as an associate professor at the US Army Baylor University. She has served overseas, including Bosnia and Iraq, as the officer in charge of Task Force 10 Delta Med. And now she currently serves on the staff of the Surgeon General. The U.S. Army is one of HOSA's longest running partners, and it is an absolute privilege to have her here with us today. So please join me in welcoming Colonel Deidre Tehan. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, How are y'all doing? Good. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm incredibly impressed with everyone of you in this room. And what I think you're going to find out in my um, presentation and keynote today is that it's really neat that you're, you guys are founded in health. And I don't see health care in that title. And you might not understand that there's a big distinction between health and health care. But I kind of want to open your eyes to that a little bit today, and then I want to tell you a little bit about my story and how I entered the healthcare professional arena. But as we talk about health, the really amazing part about that is that everyone in this room are going to be the folks that actually come to the solutions that we're facing as a nation. The health of our nation continues to de deteriorate at a very high rate. Not only that, but when other nations actually start to take on the habits of what we do here in the United States, their health starts to deteriorate. There's something that we're exporting around the world that is not something that we should be proud in. It's actually causing the rest of the world to become a little bit sicker and a little bit less well. And your challenge as you enter the health professions is to figure out how do we solve that? How do we solve the fact that we want to continue to be the best nation in the world? And it really does start with health. And I want to give you just an, a, a glimpse in that. In World War II, when we had to recruit a million service members to defend our nation, it took us four million service members before one million met the medical requirements to join the military. If we did that same thing today, if we had to recruit a million Americans between 17 and 24, do you know how many people we'd have to recruit to be able to get a million today? Four million. That is how bad the health of our nation has changed since World War II. And when I talk about health, let's put some numbers up there. Now, I don't expect you to see this slide, but you should see there's an outlier. Which country in the world spends more on health care than any other country in the world? United States. United States. You see that right up there. 50% of all bankruptcies in America are due to health care. If you look at where we rank on health outcomes across the world, would you expect that America, although we're spending the no number one, we rank up there with Greece, Cuba, Croatia, and outcomes. And so my challenge to you all in here is that you need to make us better. As you join our health professions, I need you to make us better. Because although we have some of the best surgical techniques in the world, when you need life-saving techniques, people from the world come to the United States because we have the best surgeries and the best medicines. And despite the fact that we have the best surgeries and the best medicines, we're not getting after health. And that really is what it's all about, right? 
when, when you have a grandfather or grandmother that's sick, you're not just hoping they have a great surgery. You want them to get back to health. And that's a very different end state. And although we've done very good in healthcare as a nation, health is where we need to get to. And it'll be the challenge for you as you come and join our professions. If I look at this, what makes us healthy? This is well known. 50% of what makes us healthy is our choices we make every day. At the end of the day, have you voted for yourself more than you voted against yourself, right? We make choices so many times a day. Some of them are going to be good. Some of them are going to be bad. But at the end of the day, did we vote for ourselves more than we didn't? There is a piece about it in our environment. I want to challenge you all. And you're here in D.C., which is one of the most walkable communities in our nation. When you go home, is your community just as walkable? Does it promote people getting out there and getting exercise? The challenge when you walk around this area and you try to find food on the break, is it food that helps you vote for yourself that day? Or is what's readily available to you food that kind of makes you vote against yourself? And when you go to bed at night and get sleep, and sleep is definitely the next frontier in health, are you getting the quality sleep that allows you to get up and refreshed and being fully in charge, engaged every day? Because as you listen to your patients or as you teach our next generation, because I heard some of you want to be educators for health professionals, if you miss something, what you miss might influence their outcome. And if you're not fully rested, fully charged, your air rate goes up. Airs in surgical sides go up when we're not rested. Wrong techniques go up, right? And so you also have to take care of yourself. Now what's interesting, 20% also comes from genetic and only 10% actually comes from your access to care. But where do we as America spend our money? Almost 88% of it is about that top 10%. And so we need to kind of think about doing our health professions a little different. So I get to work for the most innovative, exciting leader in the world. Our Army Surgeon General is Lieutenant General Patricia Horaho. She's the first female Surgeon General for the Army and the first non-physician Surgeon General for the Army as a nurse. And as a nurse, she really has turned Army medicine on its side. And she said, you know what? The average patient comes in and seeks health care five times a year. Each appointment's about 20 minutes. That means that they come and see you for about 100 minutes a year. What are you doing when you go see a healthcare provider in those 100 minutes? You're probably sick or injured, right? Are you thinking about your health in those 100 minutes? You're really actually just thinking about not being sick or injured, right? You want the pain to go away? And so if we want to get after health, we can't do it in that 100 minutes. There's 525,600 minutes a year, and your patients only see you for 100 minutes. Health happens in those other 525,500 minutes. Patients don't become healthy. People become healthy. And thinking about the fact that you have to engage the people that come into you as patients is a very different perspective. And the reality is, as we talked about, the health of our nation is changing, and I'll use one marker for that, and that's obesity. When I graduated high school and joined, uh, went to college, obesity was not an issue. Less than 15% of Americans at that time were considered obese. Since I've been in the Army, obesity has gone from something that actually rarely occurred, very occasionally happened, to something that now is over 30%. Obesity is a main driver of disease and obviously a lack of health, which is a different perspective to look at it. But we can solve that. And it's not big changes. It's not big changes that get people to health. It's about small changes that they do in their daily life that has a big effect. And it's about you as health professionals knowing how to engage people with these small changes. Let's talk about a few of those. Let's get back to sleep. There is a biological reason we need to spend a third of our life asleep. 
as new health professionals, do you know that some of the high schools, why are they changing high school start from 8 o'clock to 8.30? By just changing the high school start an additional 30 minutes later, the whole high school GPA goes up by a letter grade. Because just 30 minutes of extra sleep at night makes you smarter. Why do you need sleep as a new health professional? It's because the memories that you make, short-term uh, short memories become long-term memories the second half the night of sleep. Hours 5, 6, 7, and 8 is allowing you to make your short-term memories become long-term memories. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a hint. Do you know what is the best time of the day to study to make your short-term memories become long-term memories? And I met a whole bunch of folks that are interested in neuroscience um, before we started is your brain prioritized the last thing in is the first thing up. So the last thing you read before you go to bed and put in your short-term memory, your brain prioritizes to make it the, last, um, the first thing that goes up to long-term memory. Last in, first up. And that way as you sleep at night, your brain is actually making those neural connections to allow you to learn what you're trying to do better. Now why do we have people cleaning the brain up here? Well. You, if you know much about how we get rid of waste in our body, and I'll talk about our muscles, when we contract our muscles, they generate waste. That waste then goes into the lymph system, and you excrete that waste through urine on a daily basis. Your brain doesn't have a really well-developed lymph system. Actually, until about a month ago, maybe even six weeks ago at this point, no one actually knew there was a really a, a lymph system in your brain. So how does it take out the trash? When you sleep at night, your brain shrinks. And as the brain shrinks, it cleans itself. And it becomes much more efficient cleaning itself the second half the night of sleep. And if you don't take out the trash in your brain, it's just like on your teeth. And for the, all the dentists I, uh, uh, inspiring dentists I met today, you know, that plaque builds up as on your teeth. Well, that plaque builds up in your brain. So if you do not take out the waste, that plaque builds up. That plaque then leads to memory loss, which leads to dementia and Alzheimer's. So sleep is incredibly important for your cognitive health and fitness. Well, why do I have a picture of your brain on vegetables in the bottom right? Because your brain's only 2% of your body weight, but it takes in 20% of all your calories. And you guys know that, right? There's no fat in your brain. Thank goodness, right? It's one of the places that has no fat. But that means it gets its fuel from your blood supply. And so the reason you get, when you're hungry, you get angry is because it's your brain saying, feed me, Seymour. <laughs> right? It is a biological reason because your brain has to have a constant supply of carbohydrates in the blood. And do you know the more you have in fruits and vegetables in your diet, the better your memory becomes? Now let's over here. Why do I have a picture of your brain on exercise? That just after 15 minutes of exercise, your brain is better at learning things than any, than any other time of the day. Where's my Indiana group? Indiana? All right, Indiana. Do you know that researchers in Indiana found out that if they put you in phys ed before the class you struggle with the most, your grade level goes up a grade? So if you like chemistry the least, and we put phys ed right before chemistry, your grade level goes up a whole grade. That first hour right after exercise is one of the second best times to memorize things because your brain is alive after exercise. Now, the opposite's also true. Do you know if you go five days in a row with five hours or less sleep, you have a 20% cognitive deficit? So for my grammar folks in the room, that means you're more dumber. Right? And it's equivalent of being legally drunk when we actually test you out. And we do reaction testing, we do um, memory tests, we do vigilance tests, we do all those things. 20% of a cognitive decline in your abilities when you don't get sleep. Now let's move on to physical activity. Physical activity is critical that you have a balanced exercise program, and I don't need to really get into that. There's a whole American College of Sports Medicine exercises medicine campaign, right? Exercise helps treat a lot of the conditions that we do. But you might not know this, that exercise can decrease the signs of depression and anxiety by up to 75%. 
And if you add exercise to prescriptions for those that have depression and anxiety, it makes the medication up to 75% more effective. Because our bodies are meant for movement. We do so much better in our lives when we get out there and move. And what you're going to find out as you read into this literature, you don't have to be a marathon runner to get there. It's small changes. It's getting 10,000 steps throughout the day. Get you there. It's not about having to take someone who doesn't like to exercise and get them to actually being an athlete. It's about getting them moving more gives you that health benefits. Now, I have food over there in the bottom right-hand corner because you fuel your body for physical health through what you eat. And it has to actually be there in many times. And having about, we advocate eight servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Do you know that eating eight servings of fruits and vegetables a day can really be just as effective as actually taking someone through American Heart Association diet and it actually has a really of a different perspective? If you've been on a diet before, what do you try to do? Not do something, right? I don't want to eat X. But if you convince your patients to actually say, you know what, I want to make fruits and vegetables the mainstay of my diet and I'm going to have half my plate fruits and vegetables and I'm going to eat that first, they lose just as much weight as those folks that have to do the math and figure out the percentages of all the different types of food and make sure they balance it out. And there's a psychological benefit to that. Because if they're telling themselves, I do want to eat this and I'm trying to eat this, then when they go to their friend's birthday party and they have a cupcake, they don't feel like they fell off the wagon, right? Because when you eat fruits and vegetables first, the other stuff Actually, you eat it less without trying to. And so you don't feel like you fell off the wagon, right? So there's a psychological benefit to doing that also. And injuries. Do you know that injuries and performance from a physical activity perspective go up? Do you know they actually just, this published was studied um, a, just last month. They took about 150 Americans and they monitored them for two, week, two months straight. And then they put them all in a hotel like you are here. But they actually gave them the cold virus. They actually injected the cold virus into everybody in that study. And they monitored who ended up getting the cold. And they monitored these folks on everything, A to Z, to decide what actually prevents people from getting the cold. The only variable that prevented them from getting the cold is those that slept seven or more hours a night in the two months prior. Because that builds up your immunity. Injury rates also go up. For every hour of sleep deprived, your injury rates go up. So from a physical activity perspective, you see sleep activity nutrition is integrated. Now let's talk about nutrition. We already talked about the hangries over there, right? But do you know from an emotional resilience perspective, you build up your resilience by eating repetitively throughout the day? It's so good to have five to six small meals throughout the day to keep you from getting those hangries so you stay focused in school and when you are going to become our future health professionals that are going to solve all of our problems. And if you're really upset about something and something's really getting under your skin, going out and pounding the pavement or pumping, pumping some iron actually helps you blow off that steam. And your mom was right. When you're really upset about something, the best thing you can do is sleep on it because sleep also builds your emotional resilience. And that's why these three things are related from that. So what I hoped you, I showed you is that sleep activity and nutrition is a foundation for your cognitive health, your physical health, and your emotional health. But I want you to think about this. This is the first time in our nation's history we're both overweight and undernourished at the same time. And how can that be? Is 34% of calories in the United States that Americans eat come from sugar and fats. What does the food industry do if they want you to um, eat it and they say low sugar? They pump it with fat so it tastes good. If they say it's low fat, it's pumped with sugar. The same spaghetti sauce sold in America has 30% more sugar in it than the same spaghetti sauce sold in Europe. So when you deal with our patients, there is an environmental barrier to health, right? because they have engineered our food to actually have less nutrition in it. But we do know if you have five or more fruits and vegetable a day, you have a five times better mental outlook on life than those that have one or more fruits and vegetable a day. And so, why do I bring this up to you all? Because Ben Franklin said education forms our na national ethos, right? Education is the best place to create these habits. So let's look at education.
Let's look at where you've been, right? Only 10% of schools ha now have mandatory physical education. 60% of elementary schools now only have recess. Here in Northern Virginia last or two years ago when there was snow, they decreased recess from 15 minutes a day to 10 minutes a day to make up for the snow days. That's a hall pass. That's not recess, right? Do you know the school lunch program was created in World War II because the number one problem in World War II was that the nation was underweight and undernourished, and so they, didn't, they weren't big enough to serve in the military. Now if you eat the school lunch program every day, you're 20 to 40 percent more likely to be overweight or obese by the time you graduate high school because of how that school lunch program has evolved over time. And I hate to tell you all, that actually, you know, like your gadgets at night, you actually need more sleep than adults. Kids growing up, because of your brain maturing and developing, which doesn't end till about age 25, need more sleep than adults. So although the adults need seven to eight hours of sleep, depending on your age, you need eight and a half to 11 hours of sleep to perform at your best. But I can tell you, if you look back at history, we can do this. And what I need your help is you enter the health profession, whether, and I, and I had some folks I talked to earlier today that said they want to get into educating and helping our children, is we've done this before. When World War II happened, we actually had what's called the Victory Corps program. And over 70% of the schools adopted it, and it changed the health of our nation. We can do this with you. So what I hope to made you see is that most of our folks with all of our gadgets don't know when their own check engine lights on. And what I hope I showed you in a quick overview is that your sleep is related to your RPMs, your reaction time, how quickly you make decisions, your executive skills, your memory comes from sleep. How quickly you can move, how much you can do, your stamina, your ability to get through a long day of patient care is built to your physical activity. And the food choices you made in the last 24 to 72 hours determines how much fuel you have in your tank. And this is what gets you to be fully charged. So on your table, I actually have a list of what we call the performance triad targets. These are the things that our Surgeon General believes are important, is if we could get people to do these, we would actually get to a state of health. But what I'm going to do now is transition and tell you a little bit about my health care story. So, I always knew I liked musculoskeletal injuries. Musculoskeletal injuries actually intrigued me a lot. So that's why I have my doctor degree in, in physical therapy and my PhD in biomechanics. So I joined the Army after my undergraduate degree in sports science. And I actually went to the US Army Baylor program, in, which is um, up here. But I had no idea that both all the services actually have a lot of scholarships and, and opportunities to help fund school. And so I went in not knowing much about the military. I came actually, I was born in Ohio, um, just south of Kent State University, um, born right around the times of the riots um, at Kent State. And so we did not know much about the military um, when I grew up. And I had no idea that we had this many education and training programs. What's great about what you're doing as you enter the health professions is that it's so broad and you give back so much. And you can actually develop over your career. So what did I do after I became a clinician for a while? I went back and got my PhD so I could become a researcher. And what we've been able to do in, in the military in research, and I've talked to some folks that are interested in emergency medicine, you know, we've decreased deaths on the battlefield through advances in research on emergency medicine. Musculoskeletal injuries is what I look at you know that over half of every soldier gets injured on a an annual basis? We can do better than that, right? And we do that through medical research. I talked to someone that was an aspiring optometrist. Blast injuries continue to make people blind, and we need to get rid of that, right? Whether you're in the military or um, not. And medical research gets us there. And so after being a clinician for a while and then being able to go into the research community, um, I got to see the world, which is pretty amazing. And when you go across the world, you just see how valuable healthcare is in every sector of the world. 
whether it is coming to Hurricane Mitch in Mex down in um, Central America, or my husband went right after those massive mudslides in dealing with the aftermath and the great amount of people that, that lost their lives in that, or down to uh, Cuba to help the folks there after the, the, those events. There's a huge humanitarian need for what you guys are going to do around the world needs folks like you and leaders like you to step up to the plate and help folks when they're at their worst. And that's the great part about being in our profession. No matter which aspect of our profession you opt to join into, there's people around the world that need you to be leading the way. And finally, what do I do now? I actually moved into policy. So as a clinician, I started off my career, right? Moved into research, now I'm into policy, and I run for the Surgeon General what's called the System for Health. I told you a little bit about the performance triad where we're trying to get individuals to move towards health. But I also need to work about the environment, sorry, and, and making the healthy environment, and we talked about that piece. But it's also about delivering health and not just health care. So for those of you that are clinicians and aspiring clinicians in this room, I want you to remember that you need to deliver health just as much as you deliver health care. Because patients make changes. I mean, people make changes, not patients. Because you're only a patient 100 minutes out of the year. Health happens in those other 525,500 minutes a year. And so what we do in Army Medicine is we use this actually holistic approach for how we deliver health. And it's very easy to think about a person coming into you as a, a condition or an illness. I'll tell you about a lady that came in. She's been married to a military service member for over 15 years. He's been deployed over half of that. They have five kids. All she ever knows is being a military spouse. And she came in and she's pre-hypertensive, pre-diabetic. It'd be very easy to start the conversation about medicines, exercise. But what changed her health had nothing to do with that. She actually was concerned that her husband's health, after all those deployments, was actually separating them and making them a little bit less as a strong couple. She was concerned that her husband was going to leave her and she was concerned of what she was going to do with all of her children because all she's ever known is being a, a military spouse. If you think of the people in front of you as patients with conditions and not people with lives, you'll miss the boat. Because what did she need? She needed counseling and help. She did not need medication. And if you see your, your patients as patients and not people, you'll every day miss things that you don't really see. You have to understand their whole story. So what I want to ask yourselves as you move into this healthcare profession is are you fully charged? Every day you should be trying to build up your potential and your capability. You want to become stronger, faster, quicker at actually doing your profession. You want to know as much as you can about that and you get that through the foundation of sleep activity and nutrition. Every day you need to be fully charged and you might find out that when you actually don't balance sleep activity and nutrition, you're not fully charged. And I will tell you that's when you're putting your patient's safety at risk because you will make poor decisions when you're not fully charged. And what I liked about the introduction is that you guys talked about being a team and then as a team we care. And that means as a member of the health professional team, that you need to actually help each other to be more responsible in making sure that you're fully charged, right? Because as a team, we get to health. We get to health and we work side by side by all the amazing health professionals that you guys are aspiring to be. We get patients and people to health when we work together and everyone works at the top of their capabilities and their training and their skills. So as you find out, as you go through school, what gives you your energy, I want you to see the world as your oyster. There is so much potential in the health professions. And the best part about it is that other professions are about sometimes getting money, right? Or, or being able to provide a, a great life for you and your family. But every day that you're involved in the health professions, you get the energy back from the patients and the people you help. 
You're giving back to society more than any other profession I know. And I've just had the big honor of actually doing it in the Army. When I joined the Army 22 years ago, I said, I'm going to stay as long as it's fun. I had no clue that would take me 22 years down the road. And I still, every day, wake up loving what I do, caring for America's treasure, America's sons and daughters. And I just welcome you to the health profession career. I'm so excited about what you're going to be able to do these next few days while you're here, networking with each other, understanding all the different aspects. Because you might think right now that you know what your career path is. And this week, you might find out that something else inspires you. Life is too short not to do what you love. You have to find what gives you your energy and pursue it. And the fact that you guys are here in DC trying to figure out how to pursue what your passion is is just absolutely amazing to me. And I can't wait to see what you do with our health of our nation as you guys become the innovators, the creators, and the it, people that really are giving us a new way to tackle health across our country. Welcome to DC. I hope you have a blast. Um, and I don't know if I have any time for questions. Um, do, do I? Any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. I'll tell you what, serving in both Bosnia, well, I'll tell you, my first deployment was with Bosnia. And we went to Bosnia, and if you look back there, we were up, up to our, our knees in mud. Um, we were some of the first people on the ground. And it was, um, it was then that I decided, people, so let's, let me step back. Less than 1% of the Americans joined the military. And I thought at that point I was going in because they were helping pay for my school, and I thought I'd do my tour, right, and, and do my payback time. Being in Bosnia and seeing how I could help soldiers to ensure that they performed at their best so that they could come home to their mothers and their fathers and their sisters and their brothers just as healthy as they were before they deployed changed my whole perspective on life. That deployment showed how much as a health professional we can give to America's sons and daughters. Doing it on, on Iraq was even better. Actually being able to go there, I ran a small hospital off the Iranian border. And we were able to help so many people. And being able to help them in their time of need is, is really amazing. As a health professional in the military, we're in relatively safe places, right? So um, we're, we're actually pretty in, a, in, 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 most of us are in pretty safe um, lo locales. But the payback you get from giving to folks that when they need it their most is just phenomenal. Um, it, it's, I, I, I left every day inspired. Coming back stateside, dealing with our folks that have lost limbs and, and had their limbs amputated. Every day I left work humbled that these patients, these soldiers, were striving for success when they could have actually been feeling sorry for themselves. And to be able to help them along that journey is incredibly rewarding. Next question. Yes, over here. You know, that's great. Um, my husband and I are both military. So we actually met in Bosnia, to tie the back. So uh, uh, we met in Bosnia. And uh, he was, uh, he's preventive medicine. And he had to go out to all the different bases to make sure that the bases were healthy for all the soldiers that were on them. And as the only physical therapist in Bosnia, I had to go along with him to treat all the injuries, because uh, over half the soldiers do get injured. And so I hitched a ride with him. And uh, uh, it's been fun ever since. No matter what you do in your profession, you will struggle with work-life balance. Work-life balance will be a struggle, no matter where you're at. I don't think it's any harder in the military um, than it is in the civilian world. I have friends in both areas. Um, because of who you are, you guys like to care for others better than you probably care for yourselves. And because of that, you will probably give more to the patients and the people you treat than you do to take care of your own self. And so the challenge for everyone in this room will be able to find that balance. That balance will be a, a challenge. But you can do it. 
and it's about understanding you need to take care of yourself just as you, much as you need to take care of the folks you treat. And understanding that every day you need to vote for yourself more than you vote against yourself is really the, the foundation of that. Is if every day you're making those small changes and those small decisions that make a big difference, you'll be able to find that balance. But no matter where you're at, everyone in this room, because of who you are, because you believe in selfless service, because you want to give back to your communities, it will be a struggle because it's in your DNA. We aren't entering, you aren't entering a nine to five job. You're not. You have to know that going into it, but I will tell you, because that's who you are, that is what gives you your energy, and that's what's gonna make it all worth it. But you can find that balance. Now, going through school, it's a little bit hard to find that balance, right? That's even harder. But I will tell you, once you graduate, it, there is a little bit, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, what background do you need in order to join the Army? So could you join at any point in your career? Yeah, so um, I, I joined because of the scholarships they provided, right? So people can join. Um, we have all the different professions. Um, all the services have military, so the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army. Um, the Army has the most medical. We're, the found, we're kind of the backbone, right? So we have the most diversity of medical professionals. You can join at any time. I can tell you we've had people that had a 20-year had career, and I'll, I'll talk orthopedic surgeons, that were incredibly successful, and when 9-11 happened, they joined. When they join, they don't come in as a second lieutenant. We give them a little bit rank for their experience, right? So they come in at a pay and rank equivalent to the years of experience. But a lot of folks do come in right at the start because of the scholarship money. Any other questions? Yes. My name is Josh. Hi, Josh. So as for the things that we can control and sleeping and whatever, do you have any more facts or research on sleep that you may consider most important? You know, the, the amount of sleep, um, there really is something to quantity, and that's what we all struggle with, right? Quantity of sleep. But what's interesting is two out of three Americans struggle with quality sleep. So if you feel you can't control quantity because you're studying for something, and I can tell you short-term memories do not become long-term memories until hours five, six, seven, and eight, and since some of you will in here probably treat me when I'm old, I want you to get sleep because I want it to go to long-term memory, so cramming doesn't help. But if there's certain times when you can't do that, quality's important. And there's things like, simple things like not having caffeine six hours prior to bed improves your quality. Six hours it takes for it to get out of your system. So my, um, I have a Fitbit on, and my, um, my Fitbit actually just buzzed as we were talking because my caffeine window closes at 345, I mean, I, I, the alarm goes off at 345 because my caffeine window closes at 4 if I want to go to bed at 10. And so I have 15 minutes to decide if I want some more caffeine for the day, right? <laughs> but you're, you really do need to go caffeine-free six hours prior to bed to get a good night's sleep. Blue lights are also problematic. There's a reason why NASA uses blue lights to keep the astronauts awake. So when they want the astronauts to get awake, they actually turn on blue lights. And when they turn it off, about an hour before they go to bed so they can get good quality sleep. So it is not by design, I mean, it's not by chance that Twitter and Facebook is blue, right? Because when you're on your iPad or whatever tech, um, tablet you're using and that blue light's coming at you, it keeps you awake. It keeps you engaged. My gamers in here. There's a reason why the games you can't put down have more blue light than anything else. And, but that does influence your sleep. So when we take people through the performance triad, I'm just showing and highlighting a couple of them, but we have tons of modules on how to actually do that. We actually have an app called CPTI, um, for, uh, which stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, so CPTI. And it's a free app um, that actually helps people learn how to improve their quality of sleep through lessons because it's a little bit more complicated than that. But what we ask people is just to give us an extra 15 minutes. If you only get five, five hours of sleep, you're not going to jump to eight hours of sleep. You need to go five hours and get five hours and 15, maybe five hours and 30, and make decisions on what you're willing to give up, what 15 minutes you want to give up to actually improve your cognitive performance. 
And I think they're all standing there to give me the, the pull, right? Because <laughs> I know you have a full afternoon. But I really want to thank you all for what you're about to do. What you're doing is huge. The, the, the nation needs innovative, adaptive, and caring leaders like this, uh, those of you in the room. And so welcome to the best profession in the world, which is the health professions, whether, whatever route you opt to go. Thank you all very much, and have a great conference.